to uh, start with Amanda. Um, thank you very much for preparing and giving your lecture. Okay, well, I'd first of all, just like to start by saying um, thank you so much to the, the organizers, even for just having this, this concept. It's so fantastic that we can get together as a community, even if we can't leave our, leave our houses. Um, I should also say, because it's quite a, a broad audience, um, I'm going to spend quite a bit of the talk uh, explaining the models that I'm working on in detail. So if you already know these uh, models, apologies for that, but there will be some, some new results at the, at the end. And uh, this is joint work with uh, James Norris from Cambridge and Vittorio Silvestri uh, from Rome. So I'll start with a bit of an explanation of the, the physical model uh, motivation behind what I'm interested in. So this experiment uh, that you can see here uh, contains two petri dishes uh, with clusters of bacteria growing in them. And the dish on the left, um, the bacteria has very, very nice conditions. It has plenty of nutrients grow exactly how it, it wants to grow and what you can see is that um, the, the cluster grows essentially a, a round shape so particles along the cluster boundary can reproduce whenever they whenever they like and there's no preferential direction the whole experimental setup is isotropic and so you you, you grow a, an expanding disk which is what you what you might expect on the right hand side the picture um, shows the same bacterial colony but in this case it's being starved of nutrients and so it can no longer grow in the way that it wants to. And so it starts to pick preferential directions. You can see this sort of little gap starting to form and certain directions where it's, it's, it's growing um, more prominently. And this uh, is exaggerated in the, in the next experiment. So again, we have um, the cluster on the left has plenty of nutrients. The one on the right is starved of nutrients. But in this case, the, the agar is much harder. And so you can sort of see where the where the cells are growing more, more, in a more pronounced way. And again, on the left-hand side, you can see essentially it, it, it forms a, a round shape. There, there aren't really many pre, um, sort of preferential directions. It sort of can grow in all directions roughly equally. But on the right-hand side, um, it, it really starts to have to pick, pick certain uh, directions and the cluster becomes uh, very anisotropic uh, with sort of deep fjords and, and, long, and long fingers. And so what I want to try and understand is what is the mechanism which causes these randomly growing shapes to pick preferential directions even though the experimental setup is, is isotropic. So to do this, we first want to think about well, how can we model random growth in a mathematical way. And uh, the earliest models for, for random growth were, were discrete in nature and they constructed random growth on a, on a lattice. So here you can see we started with a, with a seed particle at the origin and at each time step another particle is attached to the cluster corresponding to the, to the random growth. And what you need to think about is what sort of rules we need in order to describe the physical models that we have. So supposing my cluster just consists of these six, six particles, uh, well the next, cluster, the next particle to attach could be any one of these, these empty circles on the boundary. So what is, a, what is a rule by which we should choose what the attachment should be in order to model the physical, um, the physical models? Well, if we first think about the, the left-hand pictures where the growth can happen, can happen anywhere, we believe it should happen uniformly on the, on the boundary. So we can pick one of these neighboring particles uniformly at random, attach that, and then repeat. And this model is called the, the Eden model. It was proposed in the early 60s by, by Murray Eden. And it's a, it's a model for, for biological uh, growth. A slight variant on this, you might think, well, actually, this particle's three neighbors. This one's only got one. So maybe this one should be three times more likely to, to be the next, um, the next cell to, to appear in the cluster. Um, that's a sort of variant on the Eden model. Uh, and actually, if you, if you do simulations, it, it's pretty similar. You don't see a lot of difference between, between those two that I've described. Well, what about the, the other side extreme where, where nutrients are, are very sparse? How can we model this one mathematically? Well, one way you could think about it is that the particles, that the nutrients are diffusing in from, from outside. You can imagine just one, one at a time just releasing a nutrient and it sort of performs a simple random walk until it first hits the cluster. And at that point, the the cell gets some nutrient boost and is able to, to reproduce. Um, and so this, this, is a, this is a model for random growth known as diffusion-limited aggregation, 
whereby each particle is attached according to the hitting density of a random walk started from, uh, from very, very far away. And I said this was proposed in, in the early 80s by, uh, by Witten and Sander. Uh, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that it's extremely difficult to study because computing these, these hitting properties um, is, is even a, with a little cluster like this is very difficult. But as the clusters get more and more complicated, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to, to do. Uh, and there's, I think, essentially only one rigorous result proved in the last 40 years on, um, on DLA. So one of the, the issues with using these lattice uh, models is that they're very difficult to study randomly. But, but actually, there's a second problem which relates to our motivation, which is that we're trying to understand a mechanism under which isotropic behavior is uh, broken down. And uh, in a way, if you've got a, a lattice, it, it's already broken down before we've already started because we've got these two, two prominent directions. So if we were able to find a, a reason why you didn't get an anisotropic result, you might actually just be picking up that we've got an underlying, underlying lattice. And if you look at these um, two simulations that I've got, so thanks to Vincent Beferer for these, these simulations. So this is a, a DLA cluster out of size 2000. And this one looks reasonably good, particularly if you sort of zoom in to the, the sort of middle. It starts to, to get these preferential directions, these fjords and these fingers that we saw in the, in the biological experiment. But if we increase the size of our cluster to 4000, then you can see that it really does start to be picking up the preferential directions coming from the lattice, rather than preferential directions coming from some other, from some other mechanism. And so what we actually want is, um, we want a model that's already isotropic before we, before we start to study it. So how can we construct random growth in a non-lattice way? And uh, the solution comes from uh, complex analysis. Um, in particular uh, from the Riemann mapping theorem, which tells us that if we consider a particle to be any sort of sh shape in the exterior unit disk, so, so this is the exterior unit disk, and a particle is some, some set removed from the exterior unit disk, so for instance, this little slit, but you'll see on the next slide, uh, it can be other shapes removed. Then the Riemann mapping theorem tells us that there's a unique conformal mapping from the exterior unit disk to the exterior unit disk minus this particle, which fixes infinity in the sense that you don't have any rotations at infinity. Um, or another way to think about this is if we look at the Laurent expansion of this conformal mapping, um, its leading order term is just a, a real number, um, a positive real number, uh, which we can write as, as sort of e to the c times z for some c uh, greater or equal to zero. And we can use this uh, function the mathematical description of the particle. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the particle and, and the mapping, the mapping f. And I'm going to refer to this, um, this parameter c quite a lot in the talk. Um, e to the c is the capacity, and so c is just the, the log of the capacity, and it's a measure of the, the size of the particle. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit sloppy in the remainder of the talk, and I'm just going to use the word capacity uh, when I'm talking about, about c. Okay, so as I said, in this picture, I've illustrated a particle as a, as a slit, and in the simulations that I'll show later, I will be using slit particles. Uh, but actually, our results are, um, are very, very universal in the shape of the particle that we, that we have. So obviously, we can have slits, but you can also, um, what people normally think about as a particle is just little, little disks being attached or bumps. Um, or we don't even need our particles to be, um, to be localized. It could be some sort of big spread around the, around the disk, just with sort of, sort of a bit more prominent in, in one direction. And if you, if you want the sort of technical definition that we, that we require, we require to leading order uh, the log of our particle map over Z should look, uh, should look, like, uh, look like this. And as I said, this includes all particles that fit within a radius root C of one, but also um, is more general than that. Uh, but in particular, I just sort of draw attention to the fact that the capacity, as I said, is a measure of the size, and it sort of scales like the radius, um, the radius scales like root, like root C, like root of the, of the capacity. Okay, so that's how we can model um, a single particle. Uh, how can we model a growing cluster? Yeah. <laughs>
classes is, is recursive. So putting our sequence P2, etc., uh, where Pn has capacity Cn and attachment angle at theta n. Then we know from before that we have a, a corresponding mapping, which we call Fn, uh, which corresponds to Pn. So it takes the exterior of the unit disk to the unit disk without that particle at Pn. So how do we construct our, um, our sequence of, of mappings corresponding to, to clusters? Well, we start off just with the, um, the identity mapping, so that takes the unit disk to the unit disk, and that tells us our cluster is empty. There are no particles attached. And then once we have a mapping um, corresponding to n minus one particles being attached, we construct our nth mapping by precomposing by the map corresponding to the nth particle. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of this uh, on the next slide. Um, but the key point is this will generate a sequence of mappings that take the exterior unit disk to the exterior of some cluster um, consisting of n particles um, with the property that the n minus one cluster is a strict subset of the nth cluster. And so these clusters are, are growing compact sets. So here's the, here's the picture that hopefully makes everything a, a little bit clearer. So this is our mapping phi n minus one from the exterior of the unit disk to the exterior of the unit disk uh, without um, n minus one particles. What happens if we pre-compose by the fnth map? Well, the map fn takes the exterior of the unit disk to the exterior of the unit disk minus the nth particle, which is a particle which has um, is attached at angle theta n and has capacity capacity c n. So, what happens if you compose this with phi n minus one? Well, we know the exterior of the unit disk goes to the exterior of this cluster with n minus one particles. So what happens to this, this nth particle? Well, it's got a map into the exterior and it's attached at a certain point. And so it, it maps in, in this way. And so the total map, the composition of two from the exterior unit disk here to the exterior of this shape here is the exterior of the unit disk minus n minus one particles plus the nth particle. So it's minus n particles here. And so phi n is indeed a mapping from the exterior disk to a shape which corresponds to, to n particles. And if you, if you sort of expand this um, recursive result, um, we can just take each of these particle maps and, and compose them uh, one after the, after the other. Okay, so, so what are the inputs that we need in order to, um, to construct this? Well, we need to know what the angle theta n is and what the capacity uh, cn is. And so by varying the way we choose these sequences, theta n and cn, it's possible to describe a really wide um, class of growth models. Uh, so what are the choices that correspond to the, the physical models that we, we, want to, we want to study? Well, let's first think about the, about the biological growth, um, about the Eden model. So how do we want to attach then? Well, let's think about attaching um, or picking theta n between um, two points A and B on the, on the unit circle. Well, what does that mean in the, in the physical picture? Well, A and B map to, to two points on the, on the cluster. And so what's the probability of attaching between these two points? Well, if we want to model biological growth, we believe that anywhere on the cluster boundary is equally likely. And so we want to, the probability of attaching between these two points should be proportional to the arc length of the cluster between these two points. Well, we can compute the arc length it's just the integral of the derivative um, of the phi n minus one map um, between, between A and B. Okay, and so for biological growth, we want to pick our um, nth angle with density proportional to the modulus of the derivative of the phi n minus one map. So that tells us how to pick our, our angle. What about our, our capacity? Um, well, again, in a physical model, we believe that all of our particles should be roughly the same, the same size. So in this picture, we'd like every particle to be roughly the same size. But the trouble is this map has distorted this slit when it mapped it into its image over here. And so we can't just take equal capacities on this side because that will get very, very big distortions here. So we actually need to pre-multiply our capacity by the exact anti-distortion in order to, to result in undistorted uh, sizes in, in, this, in this picture. And again, you can, you can work out what the distortion is that's created by this map um, just by doing, again, an arc length computation along here. 
And we can see that the distortion corresponds to the integral of the derivative along this, uh, well, along this, this line here. And if we make quite a big assumption, which is that the distortion is not too great along the length of this particle, then the distortion is approximately equal to the derivative at the, at the attachment point. And so we need to pre-multiply, um, we, so we need to take our, our length of our slit to be some constant times the inverse of the derivative at this point. And remember I said how the, the, the radius is roughly like the square root of capacity. And so we want the capacity to be some constant times the divided by the derivative, the derivative squared. And so approximately we want to take our nth capacity uh, to be given by, by this formula uh, over, over here. Okay, and so this, this sort of choice roughly corresponds to the sort of biological growth model that we want to, we want to understand. What about, what about DLA? How do, we, how do we choose our parameters for DLA? Well, exactly the same reasoning as before tells us that this is the, the way that we should be choosing our capacities. But what about our, our angles? Well, in this case, we want to be attaching according to the hitting distribution of a Brownian motion, right? Because we want the, the nutrient to be diffusing in, and at the point that the nutrient hits the cluster, that's where we want to grow our next, our next particle. So what is the hitting distribution of Brownian motion on this, on this cluster? What, what distribution of angles does it correspond to in, the, in, this, in this picture? Well, if we imagine starting a Brownian motion from infinity and releasing it until we, until we hit here, well, we need to look at the pre-image of that Brownian trace in this picture and, and see when that pre-image uh, hits this, the circle. So in other words, the probability that our angle theta n is between some interval a and b is the probability that the pre-image of a Brownian trace started from infinity and first hitting the, the cluster of time tor lies within that, within that interval. But this is where this um, conformal approach really becomes a little bit, little bit magical, is we know that Brownian motion, that the trace of a Brownian motion is invariant under conformal mappings. And so this is just the same as a Brownian motion started from infinity hitting the, the unit disk. And because that's a completely isotropic situation, a Brownian motion will hit the unit disk um, uniformly anywhere around the unit disk. And so this is just the probability of a uniform um, angle landing between the interval A and B, which is just proportional to the, um, to the arc length between, between A and B. And so theta N needs to be picked uniformly uh, on the unit circle uh, to correspond to, uh, to DLA. Okay, what we notice about all of these, these formulae that we're getting here is they all seem to be depending on the power of the... Um, the, the power of the, the phi n minus one, n minus one map. And you know, here the power is zero, here the power is minus two, here the power is one, but all of these quantities seem to be powers of the, of the derivative. And so that leads us to, um, to introduce a, a family of models which we call aggregate Lervner evolution, um, which consists of three parameters, alpha, eta, and sigma. I'll just talk about alpha and eta for now, and then on the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about sigma. And so this is a family of models that grows exactly in the way that I've explained. Um, we choose our theta n distributed proportional to the derivative to some power of minus eta. And I said, just ignore the sigma uh, for now. And our capacity, again, as some constant c times the derivative at the attachment angle theta n to some power of minus, minus alpha. And so those two models that I, that I just talked about, the Eden model for biological growth uh, occurs down here where we take eta equals minus one and alpha equals two and DLA occurs over here where we take um, eta equals zero so we're just picking uniformly and and again alpha equals two as before and physicists have a, have a name for the the interpolation that lies between Eden and and DLA and they call this dielectric breakdown dielectric breakdown models so they argue that everywhere along this line corresponds in some way Add to, to a physical, uh, physical model. Other sort of models within this class, um, so one of them was introduced in, in the late 90s by uh, two physicists, Hastings and Levitov, and they, they, they chose the, the Brownian hitting distribution, so taking the theta ends uniformly, which corresponds to eta being zero, 
but allow the, the alpha to, to vary. And so their models um, fall along this line, and in particular, they were motivated by studying DLA. And so you can see that, um, that their models include, include uh, DLA. And one, one of the models that I'll refer to later in the talk is the HL0 model, in which both parameters are taken to be zero. And this is, in some sense, the easiest model to, to understand because DGN is uniform, the, the capacity is a constant, and so the model consists of composing IID, um, IID mappings. And then a, a third family um, of models is taken by, in this case, setting alpha equals zero, so taking constant capacities, but putting all of the, the randomness um, on, the, on the angular distribution. And uh, for, for anyone who's familiar with uh, Jason Miller and Scott Sheffield's quantum Lerner evolution, this is reminiscent of QLE, except with the, the quantum gravity switched off. So you can sort of view this as a, as a non-quantum version of quantum Lerner evolution, if you, if, you, if you like. Okay, so, so these are three sort of existing families of models that, that fall into this, into this class. Um, what is the benefit in extending to a, to a, to a full sort of two-parameter uh, two family? Um, why not just study the the original physical models which we're, which we're interested in. Well, the, the heuristic is in, in the sense that you should be able to trade off density of the angle against capacity of the map. And one way to think about this is if I have a cluster where I have growth um, concentrated in one particular um, region, how can I construct this cluster? Well, either I can arrange that the chance of landing in that region um, is much greater. So I have a higher density in that region. Or I could grow a cluster in which the density is the same everywhere, but when I do land in that region, I attach much bigger particles. And so in this way, you sort of can trade off the size of your particles against the density uh, of attachment. And you should get clusters that look, that look roughly, roughly similar. And you can do sort of heuristic computations so that the right way to trade these two things off is by the product of them. So if the product is, is, is roughly the same, we should get roughly the same kind of behavior. And so if you look at the product of these two, that should tell you that only the sum of alpha plus eta should, should matter. So instead of studying the Eden model, I could maybe The five prime maps are extremely uh, badly behaved uh, on the cluster boundary. In fact, they can take the value zero and the value um, value infinity. And so, for certain values of eta, even after just a single particle has arrived, this um, integral, well, this this integrand is not is not actually integrable. And so, when, when I defined the measure and said, well, we pick theta in with density proportionate to this. Well, this might not actually be a, be a density at all. And so we, we might not even be able to define the, the measure. And so we need some kind of regularization uh, in, order to, uh, to, in order to actually make the model uh, make sense. And so one solution is to introduce some regularization parameter sigma, allow theta n to have distribution proportional to the derivative evaluated a small distance away from the cluster boundary, and then take the limit as, as that regularization parameter tends to tends to zero. And so that, that all sounds very nice, except there's a little twist, unfortunately, which is that the models are extremely sensitive to the rate at which sigma uh, tends to zero. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide. Um, so we sort of need to know at which rate to, to let sigma tend to zero. And physicists argue that um, sigma roughly chosen like square root c um, it's the most natural uh, from a physical, uh, physical point, of, point of view. But you'll see in our results um, that the results depend very, very heavily on this, on this rate. Um, and so it really matters how we, how we, how we allow this regularization parameter to, to tend to zero. Okay, so what are the, the previous results um, about these models? Well, almost all of the previous work uh, relates to HL0. Um, as I said, because these are the, this is the model in which the particle maps are IID, and so it's mathematically the, the most tractable. Um, in 2012, James Norris and I showed that the, the scaling limit of an HL0 cluster is a growing disk, 
uh, which has an internal branching structure relating to the Brownian web. And more recently, uh, Victoria Silvestri showed that the fluctuations converge to a log correlated Gaussian field. There are very few results for HL alpha when alpha is non zero. Um, and almost all of the results re rely on regularizing the, the model in some way. Um, Stefan Roder and Michelle Jensmeister uh, obtained estimates on the dimension of the scaling limits um, when alpha is non zero. And uh, Alan Sola, Frederick Vickland, and I uh, showed that. If you make your regularization parameter large enough, so you let sigma tend to zero, but really quite slowly, uh, then you, you get growing disks for all values out of alpha. And then I think possibly one of the, the few results um, which doesn't prove uh, convergence to a, to a disk um, is a, another result of Alan, um, Frederick and mine, where we show that we look at the scaling limit of the ALE model, um, where you have slip-shaped particles and uh, Alpha is greater than zero and sigma, sorry, and, and eta is greater than one. And we show that provided sigma is very, very small, the cluster just collapses and it just grows as a single slit. So every particle just lands on the tip of the previous one and you just get a, you just get a, wrong, a long line. But as I said, it shouldn't be a surprise that almost all of the results prove disk results because this is, in, in a way, it's an isotropic model. And so it, it collapses very naturally onto, onto a disk. And we had to work quite hard to get these, this anisotropic um, slit results and, and make some sort of fairly degenerate uh, assumptions, use very singular uh, particles and very, very small uh, regularization parameter. Okay, but what would we like to be able to prove? Uh, well, the thing we really like to be able to prove is that there's a phase transition from disks to non-disks along this line, alpha plus eta equals one. And we want it to be for broad choices of this regularization parameter sigma. So we, we don't want to have to sort of tune sigma very, very carefully to get a disk. We want to show that actually it's quite, the, the model has something more fundamental in it that causes it to break down along this line rather than just, for instance, um, taking very, very singular particles or very, very small uh, regularization parameter. And this open problem ties in with long-standing conjectures about the hastings levitov model, which is that it has a phase transition at alpha equals one, um, and that dielectric breakdown has a phase transition at eta at equals, equals zero. Okay, so I mentioned um, that the one of the advantages of broadening out from studying hastings levitov or dielectric breakdown uh, was that we could choose where in this parameter space we could work. We could choose to work in a place where the mathematics seemed more traceable and then push our results um, along these, these diagonal lines. And so in order to sort of understand where, where is the place to work mathematically, um, it's useful to just think about what, what exactly we're trying, to, we're trying to prove. Well, we, we want to prove the existence of scaling limits when the, the particle sizes are very, very small uh, compared to the overall size of the cluster. Um, and in order to see non-trivial shapes, we need to be letting n tend to infinity while the size or the capacity tends to, tends to zero. Um, so there's, there's, two, there's two problems with trying to understand um, what happens as n gets, gets very, very large. So the first problem is that the models are very difficult to analyze mathematically, uh, as all of them except HL0 have very long range dependencies. If we go back to um, looking at these, these derivatives, we're talking about derivatives of the n minus one map, which is the composition of all of the maps up to time n minus one. And so in order to understand how this derivative behaves, we need to know the entire history of the, of the process. So we have very, very long range uh, dependencies present here, which makes it it's very difficult to understand. But an additional problem which occurs when alpha is non-zero is that the total capacity of the cluster is random. And a priori, we, we, we can't bound it above or below it. It could, it could go infinity very, very quickly. It could stay close to zero for a very, very long time. And so it's very, very unclear at what rate we need to let n tend to infinity as the capacity tends to zero in order to get a non-trivial scaling limits. The, the exception is when alpha is equal to zero, because then we're attaching particles of constant capacity. Capacity aggregates linearly, and so our cluster at time n has capacity c times c times n. And so if we let n scale like t over c for some fixed number t, then our capacity has a, a macroscopic non-zero um, total capacity. And so that means we are going to get non-trivial non -trivial clusters. And so it's natural to look for scaling limits in this, in this regime. And this is why we, we initially want to start looking at 
the case when alpha is equal to equal to zero because we can get a handle on it in a way that we couldn't when alpha was was non-zero. But before we do that, you, you might ask, well, maybe the alpha equals zero model is too simple. Maybe we actually don't see these phase transitions th that we were looking for. And so just to convince you that we that we do, I have a few simulations now. Um, so this is the ALE uh, zero zero cluster or the HL HL zero cluster. And you can see um, this really does seem to be converging to, to a disk. And in fact, this is what, what James and I proved um, in 2012, this, that this does actually converge to a, a growing disk. And the colors correspond to the, the times of arrival. So these reds arrived earliest and the, the outer colors uh, arrived uh, last in the, in the evolution. What happens is if we increase the parameter eta, so now we've increased it to, to 0 .0 0 0.5, and I've had to introduce this regularization parameter just to make the, um, ensure that the model makes sense. Um, well, this still looks, looks disk-like. Um, how about it at one? So this is the one that should correspond to the Eden model, so it should correspond to biological growth. Now it's, it's a bit less clear. It still looks roughly round, but maybe it's getting some, some, some largest fluctuations on the boundary. Not so clear what's, what's going on in this picture. If we go above one, now this really starts to look anisotropic. You know, we really start to be picking up some uh, some direct, um, some prominent uh, preferential directions. Um, and if we go to two, so this is the one corresponding to, to DLA, then this really doesn't look like a doesn't look like a disk. We can't prove it's not a disk, but I think you would need to be quite brave to to bet some money on this on this not converging to a to a disk. Okay, so let me just run through that um, that again to just sort of see this transition. So we've got disk-like, disk-like, sort of intermediate, non-disk, uh, very much, very much non-disk. So even setting alpha equals zero, we do still see this in simulations, this transition from disk to non-disk. And so that again legitimizes studying um, studying the model in this in this case. Okay, so what are what are our results that we can we can prove? Uh, well, it turns out that we, we can indeed prove our convergence to a disk. Um, first of all, I'll, I'll explain the result um, when alpha is equal to, equal to zero. Um, so suppose that um, eta is um, less than one, alpha is equal to zero. We pick some fixed, some fixed t. And um, I said, here's our regularization parameter. And we, as I said, we, our results depend on the rate at which this tends to zero. And so we, we need... It, it can't tend to zero faster than, uh, than root C uh, for our results. Un under these assumptions, um, we can show that indeed the map corresponding to the nth cluster converges to a growing, a growing disk, a growing disk map. And you can see as we let C tend to zero, the right-hand side tends to zero, and, and we can actually sort of control the, the rate at which it tends to zero relatively precisely. And in particular, you can see the dependency on this regularization parameter. So in particular, you can see why we couldn't let our regularization parameter go to zero faster than root C was because this, this error term would, uh, would blow up. But you know, we've, we've, we've got as best possible um, in, in, this, in this, this result here. So when E is less than one, we get convergence to a disk and we get it at this rate. What about in the case when alpha is not equal to zero? Uh, so this, this is, I mentioned there'd be some new results. So this is our first new result. And as I said, the paper's not, not quite on, on archive yet. Hopefully it will be, uh, will be there soonish. Um, but once we, once we understood the alpha equals zero case, we were able to, to push down these lines and show that, again, we can get the same result uh, when alpha is non-zero, but we need to, because our capacity no longer grows linearly, we need to replace the e to the c n over here with a one plus alpha c n to the one over alpha. So this is how our capacity grows in the in the alpha uh, non-zero case. And I said it's it's a little bit of effort to. I mean, all of the key ideas of the proof lie in the alpha equals zero case. But actually, there's a little bit of an effort to, to push it down those lines. The paper is about sixty pages, so it's it's not completely straightforward. But the key ideas all, all came out um, by studying the, the alpha equals zero case. Well, what happens when um, alpha plus eta is equal to equal to one? Um, well, again, we can we can prove convergence to a disk, but it's our error is much worse in this case. So before we just had a, a square root c, and now now we've got um, a factor that blows up as we get closer and closer to the cluster boundary. So 
the, the way that this map converges to a, to a disk is, is much worse as we get closer to, to our boundary. And again, we've got this dependency on sigma, so sigma gets smaller and smaller, um, this area gets bigger, and again, you can see this now has a power of three, whereas before it had a, had a power of two. So the dependency on sigma is much, much worse. And if you look at our assumptions, actually, we can't even get down to one third. We actually need to make the assumption that, um, that e to the sigma is bigger than, than c to one, c to one fifth. So, so this conversion to a disk is, is much weaker than our conversion to a disk when alpha plus eta is, is less than one. But we do still have a, a, a corresponding result um, when alpha is non-zero, and um, again, we just need to replace the e to the cn with uh, one plus one plus cn in that in that case, which is the same formula we had here, just with alpha alpha equals one. What about uh, fluctuations? Um, well, it's natural to ask um, how much this fluctuates around the disk, and so we can sort of rescale and subtract subtract z. This is the bit we we know converges to zero from our disk result. And I said, if you look at our error, you can see root c is the right, um, seems to be the right rescaling to do. And in fact, we can show that if we rescale our fluctuations by root c, uh, then the fluctuation process um, does converge to something, something non-trivial. But we, we need even stricter restrictions on sigma. So when e is less than one, we can only go down to c to one quarter, whereas for our disk result, we could go down to c to one half. And when e is equal to one, we can only go down to c to one sixth, whereas for our under these slightly stricter assumptions, point-wise, we can show that the fluctuation um, converges to a, a Gaussian, um, a mean zero Gaussian with variance uh, of, this, of this form. And one thing you can notice about this is that this has to have eta less than one, because if eta was bigger than one, the sum isn't going to be converging for all values of z. We would need z to be to be quite far away from the circle, and the distance would have to depend on on t in order for, in order for the sum to even converge. And so this is the sort of beginnings of a phase transition. So we haven't been able to prove that you don't get disks when we're when we when our parameter is bigger than one. But if you do get disks, the fluctuation process has to be completely different. This the, the, the fluctuations around the disk can only have this form if eta uh, is, is less than one. And so this is this, the startings of a phase transition. Um, if, 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 it, if it is a disk when eta is bigger than one, it's got, it must have much, much rougher uh, fluctuations than we, than we have now. We can also, this, this was just a pointwise fluctuation just for a fixed, a fixed value, value z, but we can actually get global fluctuations um, where we can view this process FNT um, as a, as a field or as a, as a function in the exterior uh, disk evolving over time. And uh, in that case, we can write down a, an SPDE that the, that the limit satisfies, which is given by, is given by this, where psi t is, is complex space size, white noise on the unit circle, but analytically continues uh, into the exterior unit disk. And again, you can see why e equals one somehow is important. Um, it sort of changes the, the nature um, the nature of the regularity of this um, of this SPDE, and again, the the new result that we have is um, when alpha is non-zero, we have an analogous um, expression to this. Um, but instead of eta, we have alpha alpha plus plus eta over over here. So again, you can see it's the sum of alpha and eta, which is what really really matters. Um, and then there's also this this extra term here, which is a, a sort of time change corresponding to the fact that the capacity uh, grows. And grows at a different at a different rate to um, into the alpha equals zero case. And if you're not quite sure how to how to interpret this um, how to interpret this uh, SPDE, um, you can sort of think of it as a um, our function ft as being a Laurent uh, expansion, and uh, the SPDE gives us the ODEs that must be satisfied by the coefficients. In particular, um, in the alpha equals zero case. Uh, these are ornstein uhlenbeck uh, processes, and just solving the ornstein uhlenbeck equations, we can see that these coefficients are, are normal um, with variance given by this expression. And again, you can see how important it is that we must have eta less than one, because 
if heat is less than one, our Laurent coefficients um, are getting damped in, um, in time. The, the, higher, the higher the mode, the, um, the smaller the, the, the Laurent coefficient is in, um, when heat is equal to one, all of our Laurent coefficients are, are of the same order. Um, and when heat is equal to one, as I said, we, we don't have a, a result there, but if these were the fluctuations, the Laurent coefficients would be exploding. And so, and so again, this, um, this, isn't, this, this shows why it can't, uh, we can't have this fluctuation form uh, when eta is, is bigger than one. Okay, so just a, um, a, few, a few remarks. Um, so this, this, this mapping that goes from Z to the, the fluctuation process is determined by analytic extension uh, by the boundary process. So we just need to know um, the map that takes theta to um, what it takes it to on the boundary, and then we can just extend this to, to recover our whole, our whole map FT. And so it's interesting to, to think about these boundary fluctuations. And in particular, um, when eta is equal to zero, they're exactly the same as um, had been shown to be the fluctuations for internal diffusion limited aggregation or ID, IDLA. As you let T tend to infinity, um, this mapping converges to, to a Gaussian field. And, and when E is equal to zero, it's known as the augmented Gaussian free field. When E is strictly less than one, it's a log correlated Gaussian field. And when E is equal to one, uh, it's a complex uh, white noise. So again, you can see, you can start to see this, this phase transition um, in the correlation structure uh, of, this, of this fluctuation uh, field. Okay, so I think I just have a couple of minutes left. So I'll just say one or two words about the, about the proof quickly. Um, so this is just a, a sketch proof of the, of the shape theorem. And I'll just do it in the HL0 case because this is where it's, um, it's, it's sort of simplest. Um, and then I'll, I'll show how the, the, I'll give a rough sketch of how the ideas carry forward. So we want to show that, um, we want to understand um, the difference between our, our cluster map and a, and a growing disk. And so we can write this as a, as a telescoping sum uh, in, this, in this way. Well, wh why is that a, a useful thing to do? Well, if we compute the conditional expectation um, of phi kz conditioned on, on the cluster at time k minus one, well, this is just phi k minus one composed with the fk map. And the fk map is, a, is the f map rotated by the angle theta k in this way. And for the HL0 model, theta k is chosen to be uniform on the unit circle. And so, so this expression just gives you the, the conditional expectation. Well, then we can do a change variables and place e to the i theta by, by w, and this turns into a, an integral round the, round the unit circle. Then by Cauchy's theorem, um, observing that this, this just has a removable singularity at, at zero, Cauchy's theorem tells us that this is just the limit um, of phi k minus one um, at, at this expression um, over here. And if you remember right at the start, when I wrote down that the F map had this behavior that it looked like e to the cz um, at infinity, well, that tells you that if you take the limit as w tends to zero of this, you just get, you just get e to the c, e to the cz. And so that means that each of these terms are martingale difference terms because the, the right-hand side is just, the, the left-hand side pushed out, the argument pushed out by, by e to the c. And so this is a martingale sum, and uh, then you can essentially just use your favorite martingale inequality to show that this is, that this is small um, and to compute um, exactly how small it is using quadratic uh, variation. Okay, so that gives you a very quick sketch of, um, of, of why the HL0 model, um, of the shape theorem for the HL0 model. Well, what about when, um, when eta is not equal to zero. Uh, well, the idea is that we can write um, phi n as some linear operator plus a martingale term plus a, a remainder term, which is small. And so in, the, in this case, our linear operator is just the operator that pushes out um, the, the argument by, by amount c. And here, the, 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 um, this linear operator is a bit more complicated, but it still acts diagonally uh, on, the, on the Laurent coefficients. And as I said, MN is a martingale difference, and RN um, is a um, contains higher order error terms. And so we can we can write this uh, this difference as this operator acting on these on these two error terms. 
and then you need to show that the that the right hand side is small and this turns out to be a little bit tricky um, we, we need to use we use margin caverts to show that the um the product of the operator contracts things rather than than blows them up and that's where it's crucial that that eta is less than or equal to one if eta is bigger than or equal to one um this p operator actually makes things makes things worse and blows up our up our errors um, and again there's some additional difficulties um, because both of these depend on the on the derivative, so we need to control these long range dependencies. But that, that essentially just gives a quick um, overview of how we um, of how we prove these uh, these results. Okay, so I think I'll just stop there, just with a um, a few references which relate to um, this talk, and in particular, um, this paper um, on archive contains uh, most of the the results which are out, all the ones when alpha is equal to zero. And as I said, you'll unfortunately need to wait for the, the alpha non-zero uh, paper to come out. Hey, um, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Um, I think it was very clear, so we did not get a lot of traffic in the chat during the talk. So if anybody is interested in questions, um, there are several options. Either you just type it in the chat or you raise your finger by raising fingers in the participant a window or I also gave you the option to tune in your microphone yourself and you just do this and ask a question. So if there's a question, please go ahead. So Milton raised his hands. Please um, turn on your, your microphone yourself. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for this nice talk. Um, so last week uh, we saw the talk of um, Nina Holden uh, about um, random planar maps. So people now understand how to uh, embed or, or construct a nice, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lattices or graphs, which are better than the square lattice to work with various uh, uh, conformal uh, objects. So, it is possible to do the same with this uh, type of questions. I mean, uh, that you can try to prove for uh, something for uh, internal DNA or some other modifications of internal DNA on this uh, well-prepared um, uh, uh, graphs. Oh, Amanda, your microphone is turned off. Sorry, is that better? Um, okay, yeah. So, you, so you, you're you're absolutely right. And and actually, when I when I mentioned with this this picture that um, this particular choice of parameter values was reminiscent of of this quantum Lerner evolution, this this is exactly what um, what Jason and Scott were were trying to do was was essentially construct um, the metric ball in a Louisville quantum gravity environment, um, and so. As 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 with the the non-quantum situation, you can either do that on a on a lattice. So so weight your um, your lattice with the with the quantum, level of quantum gravity, or you could do it in this this conformal setting um, where where you you pick your your angular density off this form, but also with a an extra term which corresponds to the the quantum gravity. So the density at which you at which you attach your your angles depends on the um, on the quantum gravity, and um, what they did, they they also tweaked things a little bit. They um, their particles that they used were little little SLEs, and then they showed that if you uh, chose your parameters just right, um, your your models had a stationarity property, and and that's what actually allowed them to construct the the metric ball um, in the Lerner quantum gravity um, setting. So so you, you're absolutely right that you can you can do this in this in this in the setting. Um, but, but it, it did need the parameters to be chosen uh, quite quite carefully um, in order to get some sort of stationary behavior that, that allowed any analysis to, to take place. So are there further questions? There's a question in the chat if you want to have a look at Amanda. Uh, yep, how do I get this? Um, oh, Just click um, the, the chat option. Okay. Um, Uh, yes, yeah. So the, the question is about um, whether the um, the fact that we get a we get a disk for uh, for our Eden model 
um, but not for not for the discrete in model uh, is because of the because of the lattice. And yeah, that that's absolutely the well. Uh, certainly, the the, the the lattice is a um, is a, is a possible reason. With with our models for the Edinburgh, as I said, we 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 get the disk, but only if we let our regularization parameter be bigger than c to the one fifth. Whereas for the physical Eden model, we think we should have this the regularization like c to the one half. So 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 we don't know yet whether for the 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 true physical version of the Eden model that we want to study whether we do get a disc or not. So it might turn out that actually, even in our case, you, you, you don't get a disc, you get some, you get some anisotropic shape. Um, so it, it, it might be that both of them don't, but, but certainly the, the most obvious reason in the, in the Z2 case to, to not get a Euclidean ball is because of the, the underlying lattice structure having these, these preferential directions. Are there further questions? So are you there? seems to be happy. If not, um, and then we are, going, we are going to proceed as last time. I'm going to uh, turn on all your microphones in two seconds so we can all give uh, the well-deserved applause to Amanda. So I'll do this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now we are going to have a little break of uh, seven minutes and uh, then